Ott. I am a member of the faculty here at the Murphy Institute, part of the School of Professional Studies at CUNY. Uh, I never speak at Murphy uh, without talking about New Labor Forum. New Labor Forum is a journal that for three decades has chronicled and written about the issues and events of organized labor and the broader working class movement. Uh, I would recommend it to everybody in this room. A matter of fact, if you're in this room and you're not a subscriber, I consider you a criminal. Uh, <laughs> they are on the back table, uh, registration table when you came in, uh, as are subscription forms, uh, as are subscription forms, as are subscription forms. Thank you. The commercials are now over. I want to welcome everybody here at Murphy. Um, we are quite proud of uh, this event today and the panel that you're about to hear. Um, some of whom are friends of mine for a long time. Uh, some of whom I've met for the first time today. Uh, first, we are joined by Aliso Medina. <coughs> He's the former International Secretary of the Service Employees Union, SEIU, and the current chair of the Immigration Lat and Latino Civic Engagement Initiative. He leads the union's efforts to achieve immigration reform and has worked to help grow Latino voting strength. Over the next 13, uh, I'm sorry, Medina's career as a labor activist began in 1965, longer than me, um, <laughs> when as a 19-year-old grape picker, he participated in the historic United Farm Workers strike in Delano, California. Wow. Over the next 13 years, Medina rose through the ranks to serve as the United Farm Workers National Vice President. His interest in strategic organizing brought him to SEIU in 1986. Ten years later, Medina was elected as the International Executive Vice President of SEIU, the first Mexican-American elected to a top SEIU position. Then in 2010, he was unanimously elected as SEIU's International Secretary Treasurer. In 2012, he was at the forefront of voter engagement in the Latino community. In the fall of 2013, he stepped down from his post as international secretary to focus his energy on immigration reform. He spearheaded the Fast for Families campaign. In a tent on the National Mall, he fasted for 22 days. Based in California, he is continuing to push for immigration reform and gearing up for Latino voter mobilization. Esther Lopez was elected International Secretary Treasurer of the 1.3 million member United Food and Commercial Workers just over a year ago. Wow. Over the past decade, Lopez has helped lead the United Food and Commercial Workers outreach to Latino and immigrant communities and is a national leader in the areas of immigration reform as well as civil, human, and labor rights. Lopez launched a groundbreaking program to ensure eligible United Food and Commercial Worker members were first in line to apply for citizenship. Prior to that, she spearheaded the Union Citizenship Action Network to help the United Food and Commercial Workers members get on the path to citizenship. Lopez was head, was, was the lead staff person of the United Food and Com for Commercial Workers Commission on ICE enforcement that highlighted civil rights abuses in the 20. <laughs> six swift raids. Prior to her career at United Food and Commercial Workers, Lopez played an active role in improving labor conditions within the state of Illinois, serving as Deputy Chief of Staff of Labor, as well as the Governor's Cabinet as Director of the Illinois Department of Labor. And I could actually keep going, but I'm not. Uh, she has an incredible uh, history. Uh, Gonzalo Mercado, who I have actually known now a number of years, is, in New York, is the New York City Regional Coordinator of the National Day Labor Organizing Network, Endelon. Gonzalo previously served as the Executive Director of El Centro del Immigrante, an immigrant day laborers center in Port Richmond, Staten Island, starting in 2004, and Project Hospitality. He originally immigrated to the U.S. from Chile to attend college. He has been been a high-profile local and national voice for immigrant rights, especially for day laborers ever since. 
He was appointed by Michael Bloomberg to the New York City Commission on Day Laborers and also served on the NYC HIV Panel Council, Planning Council, sorry. In the aftermath of Superstorm Sandy, he was a leading advocate for day laborers who were employed in the cleanup, often under dangerous conditions. He established the first transnational project with immigrant workers from Puebla, Mexico, living in Staten Island, New York, that resulted in the reunification of over 20 families after over 20 years of separation. He also facilitated the incubation of the first worker-owned cooperative on Staten Island. Gonzalo serves on the board of the New York Immigration Coalition and the North Star Fund. Javed Tari is co-founder of the New York City Taxi Workers Alliance, where he has worked tirelessly for almost 20 years to organize and advocate for taxi workers. He began his political work as a student in Pakistan, but he fled the country in 1979 after the 1977 military coup. He has already been arrested for his political activity. He spent five years in Germany, then returned to Pakistan before leaving again for New York. He started off in the US in the Bronx, my favorite borough, working in the series of low-wage jobs prior to becoming a taxi driver. And soon after, he co-founded the Taxi Workers Alliance in 1998, where he has been building the organization ever since. Recently, he has been especially active in the campaign to recruit Uber drivers and to challenge the Uber business model. And there are very few organizations in the working class in this city that I respect <coughs> more than the Taxi Workers Alliance. So I'd like to welcome you all. Thank you. Um, the format will be as follows. I have several questions which I will ask the panel and then give them a chance to respond and then we will open it up to everybody here. So. In the first round, we'll just go right down the table. For at least two decades, many labor unions and worker centers have been actively engaged with immigrant workers and have advocated comprehensive immigration reform. How has the election of Donald Trump and his anti-immigrant rhetoric and policy proposals changed your organization's approach? Well, first of all, thank you so much, Ed, for your kind introduction, and thank you to, for Cooney to inviting me to what I think is a very important uh, meeting and conversation. As you know, SEIU is a union uh, that was uh, formed by immigrants. It, it still has a large immigrant uh, membership. Uh, quite a lot of them are undocumented. So for us, this is not something that we're doing for somebody else. This is something that we are doing for ourselves. Now, our union has been involved in uh, immigration uh, directly since 1996. Uh, and well, actually 1993, when we faced Proposition 187 that was introduced by then Governor Pete Wilson. And we began by working together with all of our allies in the community to mobilize resistance to Proposition 187. And since then, we have been working constantly for what we believe is something that is good, not just for immigrants, but for this country. We've been saying that what we need is comprehensive immigration reform that legalizes the presence of everyone that's here, but more importantly, that also talks about how are we going to have the immigrants of the future coming to this country? Uh, how do we make sure that they come with the full protections of the law so that they don't have to put their lives at risk uh, going through the, uh, the desert uh, or paying a coyote or uh, in a situation where they don't know what's gonna happen to them? Now, obviously, the work that we have been doing uh, has changed with the election of Donald Trump. We now face a, uh, an administration that is extremely hostile to immigration and to immigrants in general. So one of the things that we're doing is we've switched obviously to now a more defensive posture and by making sure that our members understand what their rights are because there's a tremendous amount of fear in the community right now and with our members. We wanna make sure that people understand what their rights are, what they should do, uh, if somebody shows up in their uh, doorstep, what they should do if somebody shows up at the workplace, well, <coughs> and how they uh, defend themselves. So the other thing that we have been doing, uh, particularly 
in the places where the majority of our members uh, that are undocumented reside. They said, we've been doing a lot of work with uh, public uh, institutions to make sure that they pass uh, policies governing how they are going to be working with uh, uh, protecting our members uh, when the INS shows up. So, for example, we've now gotten the University of California, the Los Angeles Unified School Districts, uh, City of Los Angeles, San Francisco, and many others that have actually then passed a policy governing how they will be dealing with uh, INS and what access they will be permitted onto the campuses and to uh, the work sites. But more importantly, we have now begun to think about how we are going to deal uh, with the Congress. Now, this is a different Congress than we've had in the past uh, eight years. And so we are trying to build enough support at the ground, at the grassroots to be able to pressure individual members of Congress in their districts because a lot of districts that are represented by Republican members of Congress also have a tremendous amount of, uh, of Latinos and immigrants in the communities of Asian Pacific Islanders, uh, of uh, immigrants from, uh, from Africa and from other parts of the country. So our strategy is very simple, defense and offense, in order to get to where we need to be. So um, our union represents uh, about uh, 250,000 meatpacking food processing workers, and um, immigration enforcement is not new to us. Uh, we had raids in 2006. And um, I must say that, unfortunately, we learned a lot from the raids in 2006. Can you put the, um, so what we've done, and I, what, what we've done, we've never thought that with the uh, Trump era that it is if uh, workplace enforcement was gonna be a reality, but when workplace, when our plants get raided. Uh, so before he even took office, we kicked into place a process where our, our um, meatpacking uh, uh, sector of our union actually had to put together work, uh, work uh, raid response plans, and that's what you're looking at in the screen. This is local too. We have about 10,000 uh, meatpacking workers in western Kansas and in the Oklahoma uh, border. And what you see is, um, what you see is the first thing we started to do is meet with the companies to talk about how we're going to handle uh, warrants uh, and come to some agreement about how we're going to address warrants, how our relationship is going to go. And with many of our, actually one of our um, packing plants has already been visited by, by uh, ICE and um, the company said, you don't have a warrant uh, except for these many workers. Uh, we have, they're not here, you can't come in. So we've kind of establishing some parameters around warrants and understanding what, how to address warrants in the workplace. So it's a really interesting kind of mix between what I call immigrant rights, constitutional rights, and worker rights, right? So this is, this is what we're trying to balance here. Um, I don't, I guess, we're, uh, I, I just wanna just, just quickly go through this. And so basically we start with really being assigned, being coordinated, we have to assign staff, we have to train people on media, we have to train workers, we have to do know your rights, we have to put together a rapid response team in the local area that can be ready to, to um, and, and as you can see, this is not asking uh, local unions to think about it. We want phone numbers, we want addresses, we want names. Um, this is about really having a plan that can be executed. So if you move down, it's about knowing where the detention centers are in the local area, uh, where, uh, who the embassies are. Do you have numbers for the Mexican embassy, the uh, Guatemalan embassy? All of that is there. Who are, who's going to be your union spokesperson? Who's going to... Um, and then the final page on this template is how do we record what's happening in, in, um, in during a, a raid. And this is the kind of information that we want standard for all our unions to, to look at, to actually assign people to say, 
you're responsible for taking badge numbers, you're responsible for understanding who's getting put on buses, all this kind of stuff. Remember, we've been through this, 12,000 um, in, in 2006, seven of our plants in seven different states were hit and 12,000 of our members were detained for up to eight hours. By the way, whether you are a US citizen or not, that's why I'm, I'm talking about, this is the play that we're trying to deal with here. So the, we kind of look at it up, what do you have to do before a raid? Put your plan together, make sure that you have people trained, assigned, etc. What do you do during a raid? And this is the second phase of the training and the, and the process that our union is going through that actually identifies once ICE is coming in through that door, who comes up to them and gives them and models know your rights cards. Um, you, it's not uh, an accident, it can be, we're organizers. Uh, we have to know that it's gonna be you five that are gonna approach the ICE agent. You're gonna model for other workers. Uh, the I have the right to remain silent card so that other workers can follow through. Somebody has a responsibility for calling the local texting, calling the local union. Somebody actually has the responsibility of videotaping up until the point that you can't videotape. Uh, all those kinds of tasks are very, very specific in what we call in-plant solidarity practices. And that means if they ask you if you're a US citizen and you say yes, you just outed your sisters and brothers in the plant. So that are not, that may not be. So this is about really having a proactive plan, um, really understanding and balancing um, constitutional rights so that you can engage US workers. and. And by the way, I have to tell you is that you get out of New York and California and it's a whole different world out there. Um, Dodge City, Kansas looks a lot different. Um, Tar Heel, North Carolina looks a lot different. Schuyler, Nebraska is very, very different. These are areas where there's not a lot of services, where there is significant number of immigrant workers, by the way. The high school in Schuyler, Nebraska is 93% Latino. Who would have thunk? Schuyler, Nebraska. Um, so, so these are underserved areas where really our union is almost the only institution that is in place to be able to address some of these needs. I don't worry about Chicago. I worry about Schuyler, Nebraska. And the reason why is because this is where Trump's base is at. This is what, this is, and if, if we want to link it to the political agenda, this is where he can make a splash. It's gonna be in Nebraska and in, in, in Denison, Iowa. That's where his base is gonna get revved up. That's what's gonna happen. And so without us having a very proactive plan, uh, assigned roles and functions, uh, a media plan, trained communicators, workers that can address the media, um, he will get a very big splash in places like Nebraska and Iowa and um, rural Wisconsin. So, so this is about our union really moving to a diff, move, moving it to a different level. Yeah. Uh, first, uh, I'm thankful to Mr. Adart, <coughs> uh, who is our great mentor and uh, who really gave us a lot of advices. And sitting in this room where. Murphy always helps us to go get our meeting at one o'clock night for with the taxi drivers. And uh, it's very nice to see and come back here. So the, as a Taxi Worker Alliance, the way we are talking that our membership is overwhelming immigrants. Over 90% of taxi drivers born outside of uh, United States. And 94% uh, Taxi drivers are immigrant and largely Muslim people. So that's uh, by Trump's executive order are very hateful and we knew that uh, how it's gonna impact on taxi drivers because we saw in after 911 how the taxi driver was uh, the first people who got assaulted by the people because uh, they think that uh, these are Muslims there, that Islamophobia is a big problem for them. So we are fighting for justice and that's why after Trump's uh, exact order, immediately a very emergency, we plan to have a strike at JFK airport. So 
In a few hours of our preparation, we went to JFK airport where we were going to uh, strike for on Terminal 4 from 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock. And instead of one hour, we had a very successful strike until 2 o'clock night. And there we saw that every immigrant groups, ACLU, other communities, first time get together fighting against this uh, rhetoric and Islamophobia. So we are uh, working with other unions and other uh, community organizations to fight back this uh, backlash over Trump's era. And because we knew since 1998, we had that fight against Mayor Giuliani, who has a, his a fascist, fascist order against the working class people, against taxi driver, CUNY student, and welfare people. And we know that how we have to fight back against this all Islamophobic and uh, against immigrant people and working class people and breaking up unions because uh, we build our power ourselves last 20 years because taxi drivers are considered as independent contractors and we are not covered by National Relations Labor Board and that's why we have to bring this awareness among our members that sitting at home and just driving is not enough. We have to stand together and fight back in, with every, all other communities for every kind of rights. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, to Keeney Murphy. Thank you to all the panelists uh, and the audience for being here today. Um, I, I, I have kind of wear two hats. I'm, I, as I said, I'm uh, the director of La Colmena, which is a, actually a day labor center in Staten Island, New York, Trump land in New York City, as some people call it. And uh, I also work uh, for the National Day Labor Organizing Network, so I also get to work on a national perspective, an international perspective of construction workers and other uh, day laborers. Um, I have to say that uh, uh, in the history of Andy Long, we have not uh, uh, seen a more existential threat to day labor centers and day labor corners ac across the country than any other time. Uh, and uh, this is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a situation um, that is not new for workers, and especially when we uh, read or, or we, we start learning about the list of uh, uh, maybe like a hit list, right? Uh, some people call it of, of the policies of Donald Trump. Day labor centers are right at the top of the target uh, because for, for, for people like him, uh, day labor centers are you know, basically a crim criminal enterprise, especially when we start diving into the whole uh, uh, conversation about aiding and abating you know, uh, undocumented immigrants. Um, so uh, we are probably on the top of the list uh, and unfortunately we are just waiting uh, uh, for one of our day labor centers or corners to be raided. Uh, and that's a reality that we have uh, very present right now. Um, and uh, how we are preparing. Uh, uh, first of all, we have to make sure that the workers uh, realize, and many of them do, uh, the critical situation. Uh, when we talk about the issues of you know, the criminal immigrants, right? Um, day laborers are criminal immigrants for many people, especially for this administration. So uh, we have to make sure that we understand exactly how <coughs> bad the situation is, uh, but also at the same time do not fall into the, into the state of fear uh, uh, that uh, uh, in many cases that can bring. Uh, so that's when we start talking about the history of our community, the history of the day labor movement and day labor, day labor men and women. Uh, that from the first moment they actually left their homes and risked their lives and crossed the desert, since that moment their life has been a struggle and has been uh, uh, actually a life of courage. Uh, because even though that they know that they might not get paid for their work that day or have an accident or being picked up by ICE, they labor still every day and every morning stand up in that corner or go to that center uh, and go and, and, and expose their courage uh, by doing that. So in terms of uh, for us understanding that our community has to understand the, uh, that yes, there is fear, but we need to stand in our courage to fight this fear and how we're gonna organize um, around it. So, um, uh, you know, as, as, as many of my colleagues here, so we also have kind of a, like a two way of, of approach in terms of our, our work going forward. One is uh, to defend and prepare the centers. Uh, uh, you know, making sure that all day labor centers have uh, an emergency plan in case immigration shows up. 
uh, uh, we're talking about not only how to uh, defend the center, but also defend our data, our, our membership, you know. Uh, now we're very careful about what information do, do we collect from workers, you know. We have to reassess everything uh, in, terms of our, in terms of our data. And then the other one uh, is uh, uh, obviously uh, continue to highlight individual stories. Uh, I think when we highlight and, and, and we put forward individual stories, uh, we show the ugly side of things, you know, with a more tangible, tangible way. Uh, but at the same time, to promote uh, uh, legislations um, that, like, for example, sanctuary legislations or legislations like the um, Values Act in California, which is the most, uh, which is the best anti-deportation uh, uh, legislation right now. Uh, and we know that if that passes, it's going to have a ripple effect. Uh, uh, across the country, uh, and also in places like Texas right now, uh, we are actually in the, in the, in the um, uh, uh, process of, of establishing ourselves uh, like we did in the time of SB 1070 in Arizona uh, to make sure that we fight the fight from within. Um, so that's a little bit about how we are, we're facing the future. Okay. Um, Suzanne? Hello? Okay, yes. good. Um, I'm going to kind of question one ran into my second question, which was really um, about preparing for uh, raids and deportation. So I'm going to move to question, my third question, and then we'll come back uh, during the Q&A. Uh, so my next question, and uh, this time I will start with Esther. Uh, what, what opportunities for coalition building around immigrant defense resistance do you envision? I think we've learned a lot about coalition work in the immigrant rights movement, and I think I think um, I think that uh, for us in our union, it really is um, being clear about roles and responsibilities. We have legal partners, we have communications partners, we have political partners, we have um, so it really is about an opportunity. I think it for us to go locally and really build stronger coalition structures. And, and when I say that, I mean real structures that work in places that we need, um, where, where structure is weak, where structure is, is uh, uh, so critically needed. So these, these rapid response teams really are an opportunity for us to really hone down and build local structures that can move politics, that can move worker rights, that can move uh, immigration defense, that can move all, uh, a broader progressive agenda all the way through. I think we, we are at a point where we can really sophisticate what coalition building really means for us, um, that it isn't a, just simply a question of friends. <laughs> Or, or supporters, I, I have to just go back to a, such a critical point that Eliseo made earlier, and that is that for us in unions, this is not solidarity work. This is, is about us. Immigrant rights is about worker rights. So Correct. this is not solidarity. I'm not supporting you, I'm not helping you. This is about us being workers and making sure that workers have, have um, the, the rights and the protections that are needed. So I think the, the question of coalition building is really about sophisticating and building those structures that can really move a political, a worker rights agenda, um, that can change the narrative about immigrants as workers. I mean, I, I kind of really um, think and, and when we're talking to our partners in small places like Dodge City, Kansas, and yes, there is a Wyatt Earp Main Street in Dodge City, Kansas, um, it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's, it really is about, say workers, we're workers. Why can't we, you know, we can own that and, um, and really stop fueling the narrative of this criminalization. Is, is, is frankly the way that we see it, is that, is that we're workers, work is no crime, and that's our mantra, um, that we really have to start building a coalition and building a broader 
uh, progressive narrative that doesn't fuel this criminalization or this merit-based framing of the deserving immigrants and the non-deserving immigrants. Because let me tell you, sisters and brothers, my members are meatpacking workers, and they dream too. Yeah, yeah we have uh, seen incredible mobilization since the election of Trump. Even, even at the airport protest on January 28th, we saw a broad coalition of workers immigrants coalition and uh, immigrant rights groups and community groups come together. Our members are very well connected to their communities. We have a taxi driver over 124 countries in New York City. So every ethnic group has very well connected to their communities. Maybe husband is a uh, taxi driver, but his wife or kids are maybe domestic workers or somebody worked uh, on a gas station or somebody works on uh, other day workers. So every kind of person being an immigrant, they are connected to each other. So that's uh, what she was saying, that we are not just uh, showing solidarity. Yes, we have to fight together on uh, workers' rights and uh, for the immigration rights. So that's why we are working more closely to every kind of group, so regardless of any politics or regardless of just uh, workers' rights, we have to work closely with every kind of a group and stand together against this uh, rhetoric of Trump. Because as you see, day by day, Trump is uh, acting like uh, he's uh, working a TV show as an apprentice, that you are fired, you are fired. This is a democratic country. This is not a kingdom. So we have to stand together. Our members are uh, mostly cab drivers are uh, uh, to get their uh, license. They have to prove uh, their uh, legal uh, papers. So we don't have fear of our cab driver that they're going to be get deported. But they are uh, citizens. Their families are citizens. They have a power to push their city council member and their assemblymen and their senators to change those policies. So we are working on that way too, because uh, uh, our members are, uh, have no fear of deport, deportation, but we have that power that at least we can push uh, the politicians to help to change those, those policies. Um, so, so I think there's a lot that, that we've learned, you know, over the past few years, uh, especially, you know, in the immigrant rights movement around um, how we're going to be protecting our community, how can we secure, you know, a pathway to legalization. And, and I think uh, uh, in a lot of ways, uh, sometimes we even clash with each other about uh, how do we go about doing that, right? And, you know, for example, in the, in the, in, in the time where Andilon uh, we're pushing for administrative relief and not, not everybody was on board, you know, I think that made our movement weaker and not stronger. So I think there's uh, a lot that we can learn from, from the past. Uh, the issue of the deserving and the not deserving immigrant, right, I think is another thing that we fail uh, and, 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 you know, we need, to, uh, we need to learn from it. Even the issue of deportation, you know, uh, when we talk about deportation and we talk about um, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, the criminals or all the, all these really bad people need to be deported or deserve to be deported. Are we really having a, a, a broad vision about what is that doing to countries who are the main uh, 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 exporters of, uh, of, of undocumented immigrants coming here? For example, when we deport someone to Guatemala or El Salvador, right? Uh, that person is going to be doing as much bad damage there than here. Uh, and that is actually we're uh, putting uh, more, uh, 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 you know, reasons or uh, uh, in that country for people to even come here. So we really have to analyze even the concepts uh, on how uh, or why a deportation should happen. Um, I think the key here, uh, as many of our colleagues have said, is, is around local fights and really bring it down to the neighborhood, really bring it down uh, to communities that are, being, uh, that are suffering. Um, all the fights also need to be connected. And, and in Staten Island, for example, uh, for the first time, you know, we're working in coalition with uh, local unions, with local community groups. Uh, they are, you know, talking about saving a former monastery, for example, you know. Uh, there are these uh, 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 
very uh, local things that we can all uh, can come to an agreement into supporting each other's fight, you know, understanding each other's struggles and issues, uh, and creating those local, um, uh, those local uh, uh, efforts. I think uh, uh, also uh, something that we have learned uh, and for us, very you know, in, in our community, very personal, there are affiliation uh, uh, is not with any political party. Our 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 our, our affiliation or our um, uh, um, you know, we respond to really the, the necessities and the needs of our community uh, before anyone else. And I think that's very important as we are going through these very critical issues where this fragmentation can happen again. Um, and then uh, the other thing is again about the concept about thinking about outside of our borders. Um, uh, we visited with our, with our young people uh, uh, Mexico um, early this year and we met with Los Otros Dreamers, which is a group of uh, uh, deported youth um, that are struggling right now in Mexico to reintegrate into their original land. And one of the biggest criticisms that uh, they gave to us, you know, representing people in the immigrant rights movement, it was, uh, you people seem to forget or not care once a person is deported. What happens to that person? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so we really need to start thinking regionally, uh, internationally, uh, because immigration or any of the issues that we're talking about, uh, you know, the, the people on the other side have, you know, light years away in terms of understanding globalization and how their movement works. And we're here. Sometimes we're very, uh, 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 you know, in, in our own uh, bubble. Uh, so really have to have an understanding <coughs> and, have a, uh, and have a regional strategy <coughs> as to how we're going to deal with the future flow, what is going to happen to the people here. And right Right now, how do we defend uh, and, and, and resist uh, uh, for our community? So, Ed, you know, I actually believe that Trump is going to wind up being a great uniter in chief. <laughs> I think in the first hundred days, we have seen millions of people marching Correct. women, scientists, immigrants, environmentalists, and I think this is only going to continue. Uh, growing as uh, his administration uh, continues to do the things that it's been doing. So I think that there's already lots of conversations going uh, by all of these different groups that historically have worked in their own little silos and are now beginning to understand that they have a common enemy. And so we have begun, for example, in our own ex uh, experience, we've begun working with all of these different groups in organizing town halls in individual congressional districts and mobilizing people to come out. And if in, those of you that marched uh, on either the immigrant rights movement or the uh, women's marches, you saw that people were there with signs for uh, immigrant justice, for health care, uh, for uh, Planned Parenthood, and for all of these different issues where I think that over time, we're all going to start working together, and I think you're going to see a huge impact in 2018. Okay. Uh, um, my last question is going to uh, try to get to something that's always discussed around Murphy uh, quite extensively. The, the Trump administration has been extremely hostile to labor, and especially the sectors at this table. Um, but there are signs that he's got a divide and conquer strategy. Uh, there are elements of the building trades that he and the uniformed services that he is trying to bring <coughs> into his orbit. Uh, you know, and it, and it's, no, it's no secret that uh, in some locations in particular, large numbers of unionized workers and, and retirees uh, supported the Trump administration. Uh, his trade policy appeals uh, to large sections of, of organized unions. Um, what are your thoughts on these challenges, and uh, have they influenced your organization's efforts in regard to immigration issues? Javed, why don't you take this one first? Yeah, as uh, being a yellow cab driver, so we are a totally independent contractor. We are not covered by National Relations Labor Boards. But we are the first uh, uh, national union 57 national union become under uh, AFL-CIO. Mr. Adart, when he was uh, executive director of CLC, he saw us that this organization is going towards bring different kind of, uh, uh, different kind of form of a union to take us affiliated with the uh, CLC. 
and then uh, uh, 2014, AFL CIO uh, t took uh, affiliated uh, us with them as a national uh, uh, taxi workers alliance. So under the Trump administration, that uh, economic is uh, a big thing for a taxi driver too. Our big problem is Uber. Uber is uh, the uh, app company who is destroying all uh, working class pe people's jobs. In the name of gig economy, they are trying to just profit by themselves. And we are fighting against their Ubernomics because they wanted to bring this kind of uh, culture and this kind of uh, situation all over the United States that the driver, uh, working class people should not have any kind of uh, rights or benefits or uh, uh, fair wages. So we are uh, fighting against them as a, uh, the result of 28th January, our strike, Uber did not stand up with us. They ordered their drivers that they can go and pick up passengers. So people got mad and over half a million people deleted Uber because they don't want this kind of a, uh, uh, model to bring in the United States. And on top of that, uh, our uh, approach is to the uh, public that they should uh, try to give their business to the legitimate uh, people, that the taxi driver who are uh, uh, working very hard 12 hours a day, and they should uh, promote them to give their business. So also, uh, we are trying to build uh, um, this awareness among the public. And uh, recently, the Robin Hood Foundation, who they saw us that, yes, taxi drivers are really suffering. They, they want to show their solidarity to us because we show our solidarity to every kind of people uh, doing our strike. They are, on Monday, they are having a, their big fundraising at Javis Center. So they talk to us that there are 4,000 people who are going to come to Javis Center. They're only going to call yellow caps. And they're going to give 100% tips to the driver because they want to show their solidarity because drivers are always giving their 100% to the New York public. Like uh, during the 911 or Sandy hurricane and uh, when the light was off, a lot of taxi drivers give a free rides to the public. And uh, we have a lot of stories when drivers are so much uh, good to the public. And so they wanted to show this kind of campaign that the New York public also want to give 100% to the hardworking taxi drivers. So these kind of strategies strategy we are bringing that to stand uh, uh, strong and uh, our members are on our one call, they stand together with us. At this time, we have 19,000 members in New York City. And uh, we have a uh, Taxi Worker Alliance, other chapters in Austin Taxi Worker Alliance, uh, uh, San Francisco Taxi Worker Alliance, and uh, PG County Taxi Worker Alliance, Philadelphia Taxi Worker Alliance, so that drivers and those all immigrant uh, groups to be together. So we are trying to fight back this kind of uh, uh, breaking up union, like Ubers uh, started another organization which is called IDG, Independent Driver Guild, that they had a contract with them that is a company union. We have to be aware, a lot of uh, 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 employees, they make a fake union so that they can come to the media and they can say, no, we are organizing those drivers. No, those are companies union. They sign up contract with them. Uber is giving them money but we are fighting back. We are telling to the driver, no, beware of that. These are sellout union. They are not a real union. We have to stand together with the really, who are standing with the principle to helping working class people. So that's uh, we are working to save our uh, members uh, um, um, wages and trying to get more benefits to the drivers.
and so on. Sure. So, so I think, uh, uh, you know, I want to mention again uh, the fact that we're bringing those, those issues locally. And, and, and you know, right now on Staten Island, for example, we formed this coalition I was just mentioning that has local labor unions uh, uh, and uh, community groups uh, and, and, and other groups. And uh, one of the things that we're doing is, one, um, uh, understanding about each other's issues. Um, so, uh, for example, when the CWA local had a Verizon worker strike, we all showed up and we all went to support. Uh, uh, when uh, we had a, a, an action with the nurses union around, you know, healthcare for all, we all came in on board and we all are showing up to the actions that are currently happening. And when we had uh, one of our members on deportation proceedings uh, uh, at, a, at a, uh, his first master hearing, all of those people came with us in support of our member. So I think uh, uh, when we bring it locally uh, uh, and, and, and we create those spaces so people for come together, and I think they are like two kind of Trump supporters. And I've learned this about for, for living on Staten Island, right? You have the Trump supporters who are diehard no matter what, you know, they're never going to change and that's it, right? And then you have the other ones, people who have lived in the south shore of Staten Island all their lives. Some people have never even left the island, have never even come to Manhattan, right? Uh, so it is actually a subculture of people where all they hear every day, you know, is this rhetoric from Fox News and, and, and whatever. Um, and what we did is that we divided the island in five sections, in five neighborhoods. Uh, um, so we created an allies group, you know, a group of people that after the election actually wanted to uh, uh, come together and, 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 you know, wanted to uh, uh, also support our community. Uh, and uh, so we have one, you know, monthly Know Your Rights session where we actually targeted towards the immigrant community, but we have a lot of the non-immigrants coming too. Uh, and in a lot of ways, a lot of the, you know, questions around, uh, but why don't they just come here legally, right? Uh, which some people still, still believe that people just come here without papers because they want to and they just don't want to go to the council and go through the hassle of getting on the line and getting a visa, right? That's still on people's heads. Um, so we have the spark of those conversations, you know, and those are where the real change is happening. And where I've seen this, you know, a uh, 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 good kind maybe of, uh, uh, of trans supporters are really started to open in their eyes. Uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, we're having those local potlucks and then we're having these community activities. I think uh, that is the way that we need to really uh, uh, resist uh, and that we can also talk about our intersectionality of our issues. Uh, we don't have many of those spaces for people to come together. We live in a very individualistic society from our own headphones to our own phones. Uh, to our own neighborhoods. We don't have spaces for people to come together. What are those cultural language uh, or prejudices, right, that people have uh, uh, in places, for example, like Staten Island, that prevent uh, 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 the, the community of coming together and learning from each other. Uh, that's that's um, uh, uh, at, at the neighborhood level, and I think, uh, uh, you know, it, 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 is a, it is a good example of also as we can do as organizations, uh, as we can do with our own members. I think we're all, pe we're all here, you know, uh, people that work in organizations, but at the end of the day, we represent workers and people in specific neighborhoods. Um, and I think that's something that we have learned from the past that we need to do more of in terms of creating this spaces uh, for people to come together. So, you know, the question of divide and conquer is not a new strategy. You know, this has been going on for a long time. And I think that in our own union and SEIU, we've had to deal with it for a while. The question of uh, the position of the union being for immigration reform was not <coughs> popular with 100% of our members. You know, there were a certain uh, minority within the union that did not agree with that for any number of reasons. However, uh, we don't have made a decision that we, uh, the immigration reform was the right thing for the union, the right thing for our country, and it was the right thing to do. And this is not going to change because of uh, Trump's efforts to divide us. And it, certainly it's true that a large number of uh, people voted for him because of his promises of uh, being, able, being back jobs and uh, uh, making sure that the economy improved. However, I think it is absolutely ridiculous to think that a guy who's made his fortune of, of uh, having a lot of his uh, steel that he uses to build his buildings came from China, China and other places, 
that a lot of the clothing lines that they have came from other parts of the world. That a guy who has made his, uh, his, uh, a lot of his fortune off of uh, uh, the global trade is now going to decide that he's going to shut America off from the rest of the world and bring all of those jobs back. It ain't going to happen. And I think that people are going to find out after they start losing their benefits should mm -hmm. Obamacare be repealed when they wind up losing their health insurance. Once their taxes start going up because of the, this uh, tax plan, which is going to benefit the rich and the corporations at the expense of the working people, once they start uh, seeing all of these policies that he's going to be putting in place, I think the old question of fool me once, shame on me, fool me twice, I mean fool me uh, once, shame on you, fool me once, shame on me. And I think that's going to happen. And what we're going to see is uh, all of these people are going to come back again there will be some, obviously, that regardless of what he does, they're going to continue supporting him. But I think the vast majority of the votes he got, uh, we're going to see that in 2000, beginning in 2018, that we're going to see a much, much different situation. But I would just point out to you that what he's going to be doing that is dangerous to the labor movement is not just the dividing. They have in the, in the books plans to make right to work yeah. a national law which would make us look more as a nation like the South of today than the America that all of us have been used to. We're going to find that we're going to have a much weaker labor movement than what we have today. And the strategy from day one has been, how do you gain control, not just of the workplaces, but of the ballot boxes and of society? And a weaker labor movement will impact each and every one of us because the labor movement is one of the best resourced and strongest uh, organizations in this country that's standing up for workers' rights, that's standing up for uh, democracy. And I think that that is a very dangerous part. It's not the, it's the things that they're starting to do right now that are out of, uh, away from the public eye. And so as part of the labor movement, we certainly are well aware about this, and we're going to be focusing on trying to make sure that uh, that agenda does not come to pass. So there were um, two groups of uh, two constituencies that were a major surprise to me that uh, voted so um, heavily for, for Trump. White women and um, building trades. Uh, union members. But I think we should, I would caution us about what narrative we want to fuel here and what narrative um, uh, is reality. Because I think it's hard to just say building trades. I think we really need to think about who are those unions? Where are those unions? Um, painters in Chicago, for example, didn't vote for Trump. Uh, uh, you know, electricians in New York, you know, uh, <coughs> you know, so, so it's just, I, I just caution us about this broad strokes about building trades because uh, there's some incredible uh, rank and file members in the building trades that it is up to us to engage in, 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 in this debate and it is up to us as unions to engage our members in this debate. So, um, and then I, I do think that, um, I do think that we have a response, unions have a responsibility, Our, is, is to have a really hard discussion with our members about the changing economy and the changing demographics in America. And they're not easy discussions to have. They're hard and controversial discussions. Um, in, in places like Schuyler and Dodge City, I am sorry, there, there isn't a, a white working class in Dodge City anymore. That generation is gone. It's a different Dodge City. It's a different Schuyler, Nebraska. It's a much more diverse Nebraska than, than we think. That's why I, I keep saying, think about the perspective from inside New York and inside California, because it is a changing America. 
It is a very diverse America in places that you wouldn't think about. And those are building trades members that we, I, the way that we engage our, 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 our members is to say, look, if you don't have a school and if you don't have a church and you don't have a hospital in Dodge City, you're nothing. Mm -hmm. And the reason you have a church and a school and, and, and a hospital in Dodge City is because there's a, an immersion of a dynamic, diverse population that has come to repopulate places in Iowa and Nebraska and Wisconsin and Michigan and, and, and Minnesota. So I think this, this, this question of, I, I say that our country is afflicted by demographic <laughs> denial. We are suffering heavily from this. And so we need to bring that back to a reality about what is a sustainable economy. How is it that workers can make a life if we keep denying that it is a diverse workforce out there, whether you like it or not? But if I may add, please. Add, please uh, I, you know, when I first started in the labor movement, I was sent to the city of Chicago to boycott, uh, organize the great boycott. When I got to Chicago, and Esther will know this, there were 100,000 steel workers, good jobs, with good wages, with good benefits. There were auto plants in Chicago. Same thing, good jobs. <coughs> and manufacturing was largely union. Those jobs are gone. Mm -hmm. So now you have somebody who's 45 or 50 years old, their job went off somewhere else. Why are they, where do they look to find a job that would allow them to support their families? A lot of these workers are no longer in the union. They don't have an organization who speak with them, to talk to them, to help them, to deal with that. Because once they're gone, their, their, their job is gone, then they're gone from the union. And so there's a lot of, people out there who have legitimate reasons for resenting the change that's going on in this country, and there is no answer for them. And the government certainly is not doing anything to help them deal with it. So what do they have to look for, a McDonald's job? And good God knows that we need to make those McDonald's jobs better, but that is not a, a, a solution of a good, sustainable job for that great part of the American workforce who all of a sudden finds themselves out on the street without access to any of the benefits that they used to have. That is part of the agenda that all of us need to work with because unless we deal with that, we are going to continue seeing the same problem. And for those of us in labor that used to represent it but don't anymore, we have to have a strategy for being able to address those because if we don't, we are going to see much more of people voting against their interests to the detriment of everyone. This is what's really um, actually cruel about what Trump is, the narrative Trump is, is that we can have a 1950s economy with a 1940s demographic. That's the narrative he's selling his base. That's the lie that he is telling his base. And, and for us in the labor movement and for workers in general, we really have to talk about what is our vision of a modern economy, of what good jobs really mean now. Not the jobs from 1950, the good steel jobs that, I'm sorry, he's not going to bring coal back. He's yeah. not. You know, and this is... Now, these are hard discussions. These are very difficult discussions to have with, with, with some of our, our, our members. So there is an understanding of what the economy is, and whether we like it or not, there is some real tension around race in this country, and we have to own it, and we have to un, un, expose it and uncover it, and we have to be able to bring these issues to the table with all workers. To, to, to try to get through this period and through Trumpism by being nice or, or not facing a reality that, that we have to face, I don't think we're gonna do it. I think, I think white workers, we have to deal with race and we have to deal with the 
um, uh, privileges. I, I mean, this is what gets me about this. You know, white workers were, have been ignored. Well, shit, so have black and Latino workers <laughs> been ignored. When yeah, the heck? Yeah. Who, who, who is talking about that, you know? So, so this kind of, what narrative are we feeding into when we say, you know, white workers? This has been an economy that has been failing all workers. That's Correct. the narrative that has to be mm -hmm. put forward. And so when we buy into this other narrative, I really, really think that part of the problem the progressive movement is having is that we sometimes fuel the narrative like, Immigrants are criminals, you know. Correct. No, our members are workers. That's who they are, you know. Yeah, so, I, so sometimes we feed it even just by, almost inadvertently, by talking about trying to get back to the New Deal. It, it feeds that narrative. It, we're not going back to the New Deal. We've got to figure out what we're going to do going forward. And too many organizations under pressure and their members, in particular the, vote, the voter for Trump, is looking back to a period where they were comfortable. Um, and it, it, those jobs are never coming back. Yep. You know, we spent 35 years in the city trying to get rid of coal. Um, you try bringing a coal into New York City and you, you will have an uprising in the communities of color <coughs> because the, of the asthma rates alone in the Bronx, it took us 35 years to get coal out of those schools and, and out of those buildings. So uh, they're not looking back. They're looking trying to go forward. And there's this question of justice for everybody. Uh, we got to get over this nostalgia. Thank you. Um, we're going to go to the audience. Uh, here's what we're going to try to do. We'll take as many questions as we can. We have some time. Uh, once we do that, I'm going to ask people to try to get to the point. Okay, uh, there. Sorry. If it's directed to an individual on the panel, <laughs> please do that, but I will give every panelist a chance to respond to each question. Right down here in the tense jacket. Hi, I'm Kathy Kaufman. Great conversation. Um, I was thinking a lot about what Esther said about, you know, wanting uh, this vision of conservatives to, of reverting back to the 50s and 40s. And, um, you know, the left has been, or the Democratic Party, I would say in particular, has been criticized for not putting forth a vision um, for our future, a positive vision, a counter vision to all the negative. And I'm wondering, um, I think no matter, no, it's hard to imagine a structural economy in the future that supports workers without probably single-payer health care or some kind of secure health care and also a solution to inflation and higher education, paying off student loans, allowing people to move upward. So I'm wondering how your organizations, what you might be doing to project a positive um, model for workers, as we all are, moving forward um, of a functional society in which there is opportunity and security. So I'll, I'll start. And um, I, think, I think this is where you go back to union organizing, where wages are raised, where benefits are there. I, I mean, I think there's, I, there's a, a, a way that workers can find some security. And I don't, I don't mean to be romantic about unions. I'm talking about how do you address income inequality? How do you address health care? How do you address opportunity in terms of promotion? And how do you address racial discrimination in the job and all these kinds of things? I can't think of a better way to do it than a union contract. I, I, I just, for some reason, and, and and this is hard, but, you know, I know a lot of you don't know me, but these are the hard, courageous conversations I think we we have to have. And that is, what are we thinking in terms of worker organizations, and how do we build them, and how do we support them so that we can address some of these issues of income inequality? So I, that's why I'm in the labor movement, because that's the way I know that we can start to balance some of this inequality out. That's well, you know, from SEIU's perspective, uh, you know, we started the Fight for 15 movement to try and increase the wages of fast food workers. We've always been uh, supportive of health care reform, and I agree with you that we need a single payer uh, in order to be able to make it affordable. Uh, but I think that 
we also need to have a, the conversation that uh, Esther's talking about, where we have to understand that we are all in it together. And it doesn't do to demonize immigrants, demonize unions, demonize Muslims, demonize people that don't agree with you, because at the end of the day, we are all in this little boat called America, which is part of a, a bigger boat that's uh, called the world. And, and we have to come to grips with the question is, what does the future look like? We're not going to go back to the 1930s. So what are the jobs for the future, given that we now live in a globalized economy? And how do we resource that? It's not good enough to just say, you're on your own. You figure it out because that's not gonna cut it if this country is going to continue to become the place that everybody looks to as a place where you can make your dreams come true. Uh, and that's, got, that's a bigger conversation about what does the jobs of the future look like and what is it that we have to do as a society to transition from today into tomorrow. And I don't think that conversation is happening as much as it needs to happen, both within the labor movement as well as within a, the broader society. But I think it's one that is badly needed. I just want to quickly say, and I mean work organizations, the work that Endelon has done, the work that the taxi, you know, these are worker organizations. So I don't just mean unions. I mean about the collective power of workers to be able to determine what the working conditions are and, and how they're going to address those working conditions. So I mean worker organizations. And I just add, add quickly that uh, one of the uh, uh, great things that um, I think has happened uh, in, in the past few uh, couple of years uh, was uh, that um, there is this training that we're doing every month actually on Staten Island and, and it was thanks to the Runaway Inequality book uh, that Les Leopold from the United Steelworkers, and it really shows us, uh, because we have to understand how do we get to the place that we are right now. And one of the biggest things that uh, uh, is really eye-opening is how the, the rate of, of, um, of production and uh, productivity and wages have been going up, you know, <coughs> fairly similar to each other up until the 1970s when we really started seeing the attacks on, on liberal, uh, from neoliberal policies and deregulation of Wall Street and, and of all the stuff that has happened since then uh, that uh, have affected and, and have you know, resulted in the incredible inequality that we have now. So I think we really need to understand also how the economy works, right? I mean, it, it, we need to talk about our worker uh, rights issue and how to make sure that we organize and all of that, but we also need to understand what has been the changes and the attacks to workers' rights, to the economy, uh, to making sure that people are having, why is that people are working 80 hours a week and they're still poor, right? And they still don't have money, uh, uh, enough money on the table. So, so those are, I think, like really concrete um, examples of, I, I'd encourage everyone here, if you haven't already, I'm sure many of you have, uh, but to read the, this book, there's also a manual that you can actually get together with a few people and actually do a training uh, about it and really understand what has been these changes and what is that we have to do uh, to fight back these changes to make sure that the economy is working for working people of all sectors uh, and that we can fight the inequality, uh, uh, gross inequality that we have now, not just here in, in the U.S., but around the world. Let me just say, the master of, di of, of distraction is Trump. So, I mean, this is really interesting. So two things I'll point out quickly. Rescinding overtime rules. My God, the impact of that for workers is amazing. Number two is, is not requiring companies to uh, publicly point out uh, worker injuries or worker deaths. Those are two huge fundamental issues that will impact all workers. Right. Uh, I just yeah. want to talk about Uber. Might be a lot of people don't know how the Uber is working. In New York City, Uber is working as a black car company. Mm -hmm. By the any driver who work with black car company, by Department of Labor, they consider as an employee. While Uber is telling to every driver that you are independent contractor. They are stealing their money when the driver was working with black car companies, they were giving only 10% commission. Now Uber is charging them 35% commission. Driver has to face uh, the, for maintenance, they have to pay their car mortgages, everything they have to do it. So 
what we did is we already filed a lawsuit in federal government against Uber that Uber should be employed and those driver could, should be employees. When black car company's driver got uh, jobless, he can go to Department of Labor and file uh, unemployment. <coughs> so few drivers, they file unemployment because Uber didn't like them, they blocked them. They never heard from uh, Department of Labor that uh, they're going to get their unemployment or not. Finally, we figured it out that Governor Cuomo is uh, holding those all uh, cases of Ubers. He's not uh, uh, giving them any kind of unemployment. We filed a lawsuit against Governor. He uh, re released those cases to Department of Labor, and from Department of La uh, State Department of Labor, they gave uh, unemployment to those drivers, and in their decision they wrote, Uber is employer and drivers are employed. So this kind of structure, also we have to fight back because they wanted to bring uh, uh, Ubernomics, as I told before, this is the structure they want to bring in every department that uh, people have a right to work, but they should not have to pay any kind of benefits. So we have to resist it, and we have to fight it back that any working class person should have fair wages and have enough benefits that they can bring food on their table. So that uh, uh, strategy also to fight in court, fight on the street, bringing awareness to the public that with whom they should stand, Uber is out in Europe. In every, almost every country in Europe, they throw them out. They have filed uh, uh, the charges against their companies. They are giving a lot of fines. Only here in New York, because they are very crooked to buying politicians. But our members are stick together with us, and we are fighting on the street, and we are preparing ourselves to fight back to this $68 billion company. May? Uh, thank you all for these fantastic presentations and for all the work you are doing. Um, I wanted to ask Esther something in particular. I was really impressed by uh, the um, rapid response plans that you have in your locals and your plants. Um, this is exactly what workers need, and I applaud uh, your union for this. So my, my question is, what is being done to have this model used across the labor movement for workplaces uh, it, that are represented by other unions? I think this is something that we should see everywhere, and I, I'm hoping that perhaps other unions are taking this up as well. So we've made um, this template available to many other unions, to iron workers, to HERE, to many other unions. And, um, uh, you know, we've, uh, we've, there's been joint trainings, there's been joint discussions, but um, uh, we've always felt that because the numbers in our packing plants, see, you'd have to raid 10 construction sites to find 2,000 workers in one place. That's the kind, that's the nature of our work, right? So if you want a big splash, you raid five of our plants and you say 10,000 immigrant workers. So they found two or three undocumented. He doesn't care. It's the, he, he wants, again, this, this splash and the, and the, and the, and the noise is what he likes to create, right? So, uh, we're, we're, we're working with other unions that are interested in implementing this. Um, and, um, but for us, we're taking it really seriously. We really see ourselves in the crosshairs. Okay, I'm going to take uh, some questions from the back. A green shirt. Hi there. Uh, I'm Jack. Stand um, up, man. Oh, yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm Jack. I'm one of the students here at the Murphy Institute. Um, my question ha has to do more with, like, what role does organized labor have in sort of shifting the electoral kind of conditions right now to a more left position. Um, and I'm thinking more about Texas because Texas seems to me a possible state that could flip and uh, turn Democrat. So it's just questions about the role that organized labor should do in pushing more um, electoral positions like the Latino Labor Coalition in Los Angeles. I'm gonna start with you. <laughs> well, let me just say because I worked in California and Texas as well. The problem with uh, Texas is that they gerrymandered the uh, congressional districts 
And so the first thing that needs to be done is that we need to deal with that question. Uh, we know who the uh, redistricters are. We know when the next redistricting is going to occur. And one of the conversations that we're having among allies is how do we target individual states where this re <coughs> re gerrymandered districts were drawn in order to ensure uh, an outcome for the Republican Party and be able to deal with that. And I think we need to start looking all around the country because what happens is that unless you do that, uh, the elections, even though they're being held, they're being held in conditions which uh, will lead to an outcome uh, that they uh, wanted when they uh, redistrict, uh, gerrymandered the districts. The second, the last thing I would just also say that it's important that I think is a real problem is the Electoral College. Because as you know, uh, the current president did not win by votes. It won, uh, they won because of the way the Constitution reads on the Electoral College. So I think that one of the things that we need to do a lot more is build the relationships with all of our allies around the country and begin to have a much more strategic approach to our uh, electoral work. Anybody else want it? I'm going to move to a different question. Yeah, yeah I just uh, I want okay, to the, our organization is a 501c3. We cannot endorse any politician, but we are thinking to have a 501c4 that we can show our powers to stand up with the real politician who stand and fight for the working class people. That's what we are thinking now. That would be our big approach also national uh, uh, whole country. We're going to do that. Right here. You. My name is Dina. I have a question. You guys are an amazing, but I'm afraid not representative of the broad labor movement. Uh, I grew up, my, my, both my parents were union organizers, and the first picket line I ever went on was against a union that had only white workers in their union, and that was the reason the construction of the World's Fair here in New York was constructed by only white people. And that, to me, was a shocker. And I'm, I think embracing the whole immigration uh, situation is in the interests of labor, but my view is that the situation with Trump is in a line of what was happening long before Trump was elected to unions in general, and I'm wondering if you could comment on the situation of organized labor over time, not just because this idiot, dangerous human being is in the White House. Anybody want? Go ahead. Well, let me just say that uh, the labor movement of today is not the labor movement of 1965 when I first joined the union. There were no Latinos in any right. uh, leadership That's position. Right. There are right. no very few African Americans in positions of leadership, certainly no Asians, uh, Pacific Islanders. Today, you got an international secretary treasurer of one of the largest unions SEIU. in America. In SEIU, you have an African-American uh, secretary treasurer. And if you look around the labor movement now, you are starting to see the face of America today. Uh, and I think that's a good thing uh, because it's made the labor movement a lot stronger. And I think that uh, they are being elected not just by Latinos or African-Americans or Asians, they're being elected by everyone including the, the Caucasian membership. And so I think the labor movement uh, uh, has begun to change, and I think it, uh, not a moment too soon. Well, let me, let me just give you an example. In our union, um, our Know Your Rights cards are in 25 languages. Wow. Um, our contracts are, are, are easily in... Um, four or five languages, depending on which plant you're working on. Uh, our union has a, a, has a commitment now to do multi-language interpretation in different spaces, to, to, um, uh, to really think of what we call language equity in, within our union, so that we are not just addressing the larger 
the majority of workers, but if there are three Somali workers in that meeting, they should have access to be able to express themselves and be heard just as well. So, so these are hard changes. Let me not, I, I'm, I'm not at all romanticizing this kind of stuff. It's taken a lot. It takes money investments. It takes it takes political capital. It takes a lot to make these kinds of fundamental changes. But I do want to just kind of go back and say, you know, my mother, my dad used to lament over the bad, the good old days. And I would say the same thing for labor. Watch what you're asking for. Uh, you just might get it. Uh, and my mom would remind him that it was no fun going to wash clothes in the river. She much more liked pressing buttons on the machine. So, um, and by the way, let me just, I, for, I for neglected to mention that of the largest unions, of the 10 largest unions in America, the three of the largest are led by women. That was not true in 1965. We're a majority women's union. We are, we are uh, almost half people of color and half uh, white workers in our union. But overall, the percentage is down. Well, let's just move on. Uh, the oh. woman in the glasses right there. Although our, our membership has been high. Hi, uh, my name's Farah Kimji. I'm a researcher. Uh, my name's Farah Kimji. I'm a researcher at 1199 at CIU here in the city. Um, my question is about um, uh, what, what do you all think is the role of unions in um, the political education of their members? Um, I think that's a question that we've been grappling with um, at, at our union for sure, because um, although 1199 is largely, uh, our membership is largely people of color, a huge, Im hugely immigrant, um, we also did have a significant percentage of our membership that did vote for Trump as well. Um, and I think that's something that we have to deal with internally, like as a labor movement as a whole. And so I, I was just thinking, like, what, what do you think can be and should be the role of unions in not only winning better contracts, but making sure that we're continuing to do this ground, you know, 101 political education and teaching about worker solidarity and class-based organizing um, to our members? Gonzalo, you're on Staten Island. Why don't you take the first picture? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think you know I, I, I can I can talk a little bit about the perspective or of our membership, many of whom do not have the right to vote uh, because of their uh, immigration status. Uh, but that hasn't stopped from us to becoming politically active or, or you know, like to frame it more around civic engagement because of our 501c3 status as well. Uh, but uh, you know. We are uh, 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 an organization in Staten Island where maybe 90% of our members are undocumented, yet last year we helped register a thousand new voters in, um, in Staten Island alone. Uh, uh, by going out there, you know, talking about how important it is to vote, like telling our uh, members, friends, children who uh, may have been born here, you know, and they're over 18, they haven't registered to vote, going to the high schools and talking to the students uh, about, you know, very locally how, uh, what are the issues of undocumented workers in Staten Island who keep every single lawn beautiful, clean every single pool, clean every single house, and really started to have those, uh, you know, in Spanish we call it concientización uh, uh, of really uh, uh, bringing the issues to the front, having those spaces for conversation and engage people regardless if they have the, uh, if they're eligible to vote or not. We may not have the right to vote, but we still have a voice, we still have friends, we still have employers, we still have family um, uh, who do that. So, so that's why, uh, you know, what, what can I say, I think, uh, in terms of general. And then just going back to the same uh, uh, concept of uh, understanding how did we get to this place today, you know. Uh, it's, you know, around history, is around race, is around the economy, is around the movement of people and what sparks that movement. I think one of the conversations that we never have around immigration, it is, you know, what are the root causes of migration, right? What is that make people come here and risk their life in the first place? And we did something very simple. We went to the town where most of our members come from Mexico. Uh, we went there, we tried to understand what is the root cause of migration. It's not a rocket science, you know, we understand these are decimated communities, they have no jobs, they're beautiful, 
right? They're beautiful, but they're completely isolated from their own government. Now add, you know, layers of violence and drug trafficking and all that stuff, you know, who make conditions even worse. But, you know, the, the, um, uh, the, the solution to, uh, you know, stopping migration or the flow, flow of people, and, and I think, you know, that should be a right, you know, that you should not, like, think about stopping it, because everybody should be able to move about uh, like, you know, the migrant, you know, beings that we are, you know, uh, uh, but uh, is, you know, to not talk about, you know, building bigger walls or, you know, stopping people, because people are going to find any way to get here when, when you need to feed your family, right? Uh, so if we don't invest in the root causes of migration, and sometimes, you know, this is the conversations that we're, again, we're not having, right? Uh, because we don't, we want to sometimes concentrate on just people, you know, having a path to legalization and becoming Americans. Not everybody wants to do that. You know, I know people who have been working here for 15, 20 years um, in the harshest jobs. They're building their home back in Mexico, right? And they have the hope that one day they're going to go back and spend their last years after all their work. So we're not having those conversations. We're not empowering, empowering people at the local level. How do we stop this visual this vicious cycle of migration. People in that town right now, uh, kids who are 15, 16 years old are stopping you know, uh, their school and they're coming here because they're seeing their cousins and their uncles and their friends you know, uh, who are making money and they want to go to New York and also make money like their friends and their families. Um, so I think you know, having that real conversation, again, outside of you know, our regular you know, United States concepts, uh, having a regional approach, uh, uh, divesting money from enforcement into uh, 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 investing in communities of origin so we can create good jobs. Talk about, you know, democratic uh, economic models like the worker co-ops or any other things, you know, being, being, uh, making sure that workers have the right to organize and fight for better working conditions in Mexico, in Central America, I think are more of what we need to do now. Anybody else want it? Well, I'll just, I'll just say this, is, is for us, it's really going back to really talking to our members about issues they care about and less about political parties and, and less about politicians. It really is about helping our members understand what health care means, what all these kinds of issues really mean, uh, rather than support this candidate or support that candidate. And let me just uh, mention one other thing, uh, building on what Esther said is we have to make sure that our members and society in general understands the proper role of unions in society. We've allowed ourselves to be pigeonholed as being just about wages and hours and working conditions at the work site. But from hard experience, we know that no matter how good a job we do in, uh, in, at, the, at the work site, the fact is our members don't live at the work site 24 hours a day when they leave, they go out into a community, and if there's a bad air and there's bad water, uh, if the infrastructure is terrible, you know, that impacts our members. And so we have an appropriate role as being able to uh, address all of those questions that deal with people's quality of life and their role in society. And the union is their voice, not only in the workplace, but it's also their voice in the political arena and in the policy arena. And so that is our appropriate role, and we have allowed ourselves to be uh, taken out of that role and limited to just simply wages and hours.